Today we're talking about phylum arthropoda. And there's many, many organisms in this group. Probably this is the most populated phylum of all animals, the most uh, diverse, most different numbers of species and so forth. So uh, we need to talk about what they have in common. And basically all arthropods share three basic characteristics. One is they have segmented bodies, like we see there. And a classic example of this is like an ant with three body segments. Typically, arthropods have either three body segments or two. They have the head, the thorax, and the abdomen, or they have the cephalothorax and the abdomen, where the head and the thorax are combined into one. They also have jointed legs, very similar to our joints, lots of hinge joints. Uh, helps in uh, moving around, and a chitinous exoskeleton. So this is a very strong and very lightweight exoskeleton, uh, very different than, say, the outer shell of a mollusk. Uh, and there's one problem with this chitinous exoskeleton in that as the organism grows, that exoskeleton does not grow. So they must molt it and form a new larger one. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, so uh, this group includes spiders, insects, all those things we call bugs, crustaceans, crabs, lobsters, shrimp, copepods, which we've looked at under the microscope in class, and barnacles. Uh, scientists believe there could be as, as many as a, over a 1 million different species of arthropods. Uh, some scientists believe that number could be as high as 20 million. Uh, just the insects alone. So we really don't know how many different species of arthropods there are out there, but we know that there are a lot. Um, this is what we're going to focus on. We're going to focus on three of the classes, Serapedia, which are the barnacles, Copepoda, which are the copepods, and Malacostrica, which makes up the decapods, which are the tin-legged uh, members of this group, which includes uh, lobsters, crabs, shrimp, those kind of things, and Euphasia, which are the krill. Uh, we think of krill when we think of the organisms that the, the baleen whales like to eat. So barnacles. These are the least arthropod-looking arthropods out there. Uh, life begins, they're free-floating in the ocean as plankton, and eventually they settle upside down on a hard substrate, form a shell around them. They cement themselves to that, to whatever structure they, they land on, and they, they uh, build their, they form their adult body. Uh, most of us are familiar with what uh, barnacles look like. Here's a, I'm not going to show the video, but we definitely see these uh, gooseneck barnacles uh, attached to a buoy that was uh, floating around. Um, here's an example. So what do barnacles do? They have these two little trap doors around their opening and they open them up and then their legs sticking up and they move water kind of like this, creating a current of water across their mouth. And as that happens, they can filter food out of it. So this is a little video of them uh, feeding and they're feeding in water that has uh, bioluminescent dinoflagellates floating in the water. So as they agitate the water, the dinoflagellates give off bursts of light. So we'll watch a little bit of this. All right, you get the idea. You can see these little, the legs, they stick up, remember they're on their back, so the legs are pointing up. Here's some other classic examples of, of barnacles. This is a gooseneck barnacle. But we see them attached to rocks. We see them attached to whales, even manatees, and also sea turtles. These barnacles can grow. So really interesting, uh, this glue. So they literally create a glue that, that cements themselves to whatever structure. And what's unique about this glue is it hardens, it dries, it sets underwater. Most glues, if you read the label and almost any glue that you uh, buy, it always says make sure the area is dry. So there's a lot of research trying to understand this glue, especially in dentistry. 
uh, for fillings and, and repairing teeth and stuff like that. So this is a, it's a biological glue cement that can harden uh, set underwater. Uh, a few more pictures. This is a big barrel with gooseneck barnacles attached to it. So it's floating in the ocean for a while. Uh, uh, Gordon Ramsay did a little episode where these guys went out and collected it. We're not going to watch that video, but check it out. Uh, and then he cooks up a little meal. The hulls of ships and even the the, the uh, propellers can be covered in barnacles. And you look at that. We call these fouling organisms. And this really caused a problem because this greatly affects the hydrodynamics of the ship. Uh, slows it down. You have to use more energy, more power, more electricity, more fuel uh, to run it. So those are all negative things in, in, when it comes to if this is a cargo ship uh, moving materials from one side of the ocean to the other. So periodically they're pulled out of the water on rail, it's called, and the sides of these ships are scraped and they're apply, applied a paint job. And typically that paint has some sort of uh, anti-fouling agent in it. Quite often it's copper because copper is actually toxic to most invertebrates. See, so if you go to a, to a restaurant or somewhere and there's all these fish tanks, all these marine organisms in there and you, you see penny, people wanting to throw pennies in there, bad thing to do, never do that. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll watch a little bit of this. this um, so this is kind of interesting. Uh, barnacles, like uh, most all arthropods, have internal fertilization. So this is kind of tough for them because barnacles are physically attached. So you could, the males will actually extend their male reproductive structure and search for a female, like we see in this right here. So that's the male reproductive structure. All right, keep going. So copepods, um, most are, are less than a millimeter in size. Um, they're really important as second, uh, primary and secondary consumers because they feed on phytoplankton that most other organisms cannot feed on because they are so small. So they can feed on the phytoplankton, they're larger, and then there's many different organisms that can feed on them. So they're an important link in the food chain. Um, they also, something that's kind of cool, another thing that happens is they, they concentrate the waste products, the undigestible material into these little fecal pellets, and then they can fall to the ocean floor very quickly, literally in a matter of days, rather than if it was a dead phytoplankton taking a matter of months to go to the bottom. Then there's organisms in the deep ocean that feed on the fecal material from the surface of the ocean. And this falling fecal material is called marine snow. Actually, has kind of a white color to it. Here's some pictures of some copepods. We've looked at these under the, the microscope. This is what copepod uh, or what plankton in uh, SpongeBob kind of resembles. That one eye spot there. Over here, we see that one eye spot in the two antenna. All right, Malacostrica, decapods. That's what we want to focus on here. Uh, these are the crabs, the shrimp, uh, lobsters, crayfish, those kind of animals. Um, all members have 10 functional legs, typically found in, in, pair, in five pairs. Uh, typically, they have claws of some sort on some of those. Some of them are very reduced. They can't hurt you. Others are very large, uh, like, a, like a main lobster. And they have a carapace, off that hard exoskeleton covering their body. And they're also a very important food source for us. We think of crabs we eat, shrimp we eat, lobsters we eat. But just like anything else that we tend to really enjoy to eat from the ocean, we've overexploited them and overfished many of the fisheries of, this or of these organisms. But that's a terrible thing. Um, all right, a little bit about uh, shrimp, because in case you didn't know, I really, really love shrimp. Anyway, like I was saying, Shrimp is the food of the sea. You can barbecue it, boil it, broil it, bake it, saute it. They on um, shrimp kebabs, shrimp creole, shrimp gumbo, pan fried, deep fried, stir fried. There's pineapple shrimp, uh, lemon shrimp, coconut shrimp, pepper shrimp, cave shrimp, shrimp stew, shrimp salad, shrimp and potato, shrimp burger. Cave shrimp. That's, that's about it. So a lot of things you can do with shrimp, obviously. All right, so um, so on the decline, so let's talk about the American lobster real quick. You know, um, that's the, 
the from the red lobster restaurants the big red lobster they used to be really common to get up to 44 pounds lobsters literally better back up here you know that big and now a good pound to two pound one about that big is what you find in most restaurants uh the blue crabs are also severely reduced uh many shrimp species and another problem associated with uh these fisheries are is the bycatch problem this is mainly a problem with shrimp species shrimpers have these big the boats the big nets they drag along the bottom and they 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 trap they catch these swarms of shrimp you know schools of shrimp but they also catch a lot of fish in there possibly you know sea turtles uh dolphins can usually you know outswim them but um what happens is by the time they pull those nets, whatever organisms are in there got crushed in the net and suffocated in the back of the net and the cod end is called and die. So there's a huge bycatch that is wasted. All those other things that bycatch is typically just thrown back over into the ocean. It doesn't really have an economic value or not as high of an economic value as the uh, shrimp that are caught. So it's a terrible thing for the uh, turtles, sea turtles. That was a huge problem. And then we, uh, as we talked about in class before, the TEDs, the TEDs, the turtle exclusion devices, uh, a device that was added to the nets to help the uh, the crabs get out. I think I have a little slide on that somewhere. Maybe I'll come back to that in a little while. Um, but anyhow, so here's some other examples of some some decapods. We have blue crabs up here. This is the Caribbean spiny lobster. This is the main lobster, the American lobster. Notice those huge claws right there. Two different types, kind of interesting. One is for tearing and one is for crushing. Now the Caribbean lobster, what's missing is that big front pair of claws. They have very small little pinchers, so they don't try to crush things. These are coconut crabs, the largest of the uh, hermit crab type of crabs, and they actually don't have live in a shell. Their abdomen is very, very uh, hard and stuff, the exoskeleton, but they climb up the trees, can break open coconuts. They can get really, really big. All right, what else? Um, here are some others, hermit crabs, which we all know about. Here's a hermit crab actually up in a uh, glass shell. So you can see that abdomen there. In a minute, I'm actually going to show you a, a video of a hermit crab leaving its shell. Now, why do hermit crabs live in shells? That's a great question. And basically, their abdomen, the back part there, is not protected by a hard exoskeleton. It's very soft, so it's very vulnerable. So they actually uh, find shells from mollusks, from gastropods, and they can put their, their abdomen up in there and hide in there and protect it in there. But as the hermit crab grows, obviously the shell that it, it's found is not grow, so they have to find a new shell. Here's a really big shrimp. Um, here's a video of, uh, about these, these uh, coconut crabs. Is this crab for real? I. Adam here, and you're watching the Epic Wildlife Series. The largest land-living arthropod in the world is the giant coconut crab. Also known as the robber crab, the coconut crab is a species of terrestrial hermit crab found on islands across the Indian Ocean, parts of the Pacific Ocean, and as far east as the Gambia Islands. The crab can weigh up to nine pounds reaching the upper size limit of terrestrial animals with exoskeletons. They can grow up to 16 inches with a leg span of more than three feet and have an average lifespan of 60 years. As juveniles, the coconut crab, much like the hermit crab, uses empty shells for protection. But as adults, they develop a tough exoskeleton and no longer need the shell. The crab cannot swim and is submerged underwater for very long, they will drown. They have an acute sense of smell, which helps them to locate food sources such as fruits, nuts, and seeds. The crab also has the ability to climb trees and crack open coconut shells. However, coconuts are not a significant part of their diet. The crab is considered an omnivore and will feed on tortoise hatchlings, dead animals, and has been observed preying upon other species of crab. Their numbers have declined and they have become extinct in some areas due to habitat loss and human predation, forcing conservation. So once again, something that's commonly, you know, something that's an arthropod that is, uh, you know, edible and uh, favored quickly, uh, the species 
goes on the decline. Um, the mantis shrimp is also a really neat uh, example of arthropod. They have basically two different types and they have these really strong, uh, powerful uh, appendages, their front set of legs that for some species can actually break aquarium glass and can uh, break the shells of, of mollusks. Let's watch a little bit about this guy. And that, look at that, they, they totally cracked open that clam shell, so pretty neat. Oh, uh, or skip that one. Um, here's an example of hermit crabs trying to find uh, a shell. So this is a great video to watch here. If, go back to it. And here's another video of hermit crabs changing shells and they want to fast forward it here just a little bit get to the right spot not till the end right about here and you'll see the, the fuzzy exposed abdomen with no protection from the exoskeleton thing to look at. All right, so back to bycatch. So this is some of the problems with bycatch. These are some photos here showing shrimp nets full of all sorts of other stuff from sea turtles to many different species of fish, stingrays, sea stars. All this bycatch will typically die uh, once it's on the deck or before it even gets to the deck of the shrimp boats. So. Uh, and this is what the turtle exclusion device looks like. So material comes through here down to the cod end and most small stuff can fit through these slits, but uh, large things get pushed this way and out through a little slot. Uh, we see just the opposite going in this direction right there. So a very good thing for sea turtles, turtle exclusion device. Um, blue crabs we're not going to really talk about. And this is our last order, you know, under class. This is krill and a very, another very important uh, step in the move in marine food webs, considered a primary consumer that can be eaten by lots of other organisms. Most krill are about, you know, this big, so they're pretty small. So they're considered plankton, uh, plankton and can swim in huge swarms, but they're not microscopic plankton. Um, and of course we know, here's some photos that blue whales Humpback whales uh, love to eat krill. We find the krill, swarms of krill of it down in the south, southern ocean and in the northern uh, reaches of our oceans, you know, just outside the poles and stuff like that, where there's huge, massive swarms. Uh, here's a blue whale uh, feeding. This is a humpback there, I believe. And I got a couple videos on this. Um, and that is it. So we'll stop there. That finishes up our talk on Arthropoda.